and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, September the 30th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 177. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm glad that you're here. If you're brand new, welcome. Thanks for being here. And if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down at the video description below. So when you look at little identifier, the title underneath this video on YouTube, you'll see a little thing that says more. I think if you click on that, it will expand and show you everything that's down there. Some people didn't know that. So that's interesting too. So what we're doing here is we're just answering the questions that were posted over the last week. How do you submit your question? You also look for the link down in the video description for that, which takes you to my website, thewaytobe.org, and you click on the page titled The Way to Be. There's a form there. There's other stuff too. So I'm glad you're here spending your time with me. Those of you who are on the road driving and stuff, uh, thank you for listening. It's also available as a podcast, so you don't have to stare at your screen and like wreck your tractor or something. So uh, podcast is at Podbean, The Way to Be. You can Google it, podcast The Way to Be, because also three other podcast sites have picked it up. So that's interesting too and fun, totally free, all of it. So that's going on. What else we have going on? Lots of rain. We just came out of a bunch of storms this morning. What was the temperature? I know you wanted to know. 30 degrees Fahrenheit. We had a hard frost last night. That's minus one Celsius. And then what happened? Well, I just went outside and shot a bunch of sequences to follow up this video today. So you'll be able to see those at the end. 64 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 18 degrees Celsius. So that was a 34 degree change. Rapid. So you should be happy that I'm sitting here because I really wanted to stay outside where it's nice and warm. It's a great day to work on the beehives. And we're doing those last minute finalizing of all the hives. Some of you may want to know about some of the other hives, uh, what's going on with them. So I included those in my closeout video, which probably won't have a narration, maybe just some music because there's some slow motion sequences and stuff like that. But you'll see hive number 30 in there, which is the Ape of May hive that we put a swarm in. We put a swarm in it. The queen left. They're building queen cells. We had concerns about that. We took it from a 10 frame to a five frame nucleus because they come with these dividers that you can put in there. So we're fooling with that. And also you may be interested in knowing that they sealed up those air vents in the top of that. Everything that was accessible to the bees in the top is propolized now and they're very active. So I shot a sequence of that so you can see that's going on too. The other thing we had concerns about was this time of year, are there enough drones out there so that, uh, in other colonies, for example, if you had a colony that did what that one did, which is create emergency queen cells, a whole bunch of them. So they generated new queens. One of those queens is going to represent that high. She has to fly out. She has to get mated and she has to get back. And this is the weather for that to happen. So it actually could because I noticed there were plenty of drones on most of the hives out in the apiary. So I think their chances actually are pretty darn good and the activity is strong. So it's a great time. Also, for those of you who are like me in Northeastern United States, you might be just in this region. You would have noticed it today with the warm up after all the rain that we've had, all the storms that we've had, that the bees are all flying. And some people have concerns when they see so much activity that they might be swarming or preparing to swarm. No, they've just been cooped up for days. So that all sounds good to me. What else? I think that's pretty much it. The opening sequences. I hope you enjoyed those. I found, uh, went out early, looked for drones because they are casting out drones, even though there still seem to be plenty in the air ready to mate with virgin queens from other colonies. They don't mate with their own. And I found them in the rain, on the landing boards, in the cold. That's why I did a slow motion sequence of the drone that I found, brought it inside, let it dry out, and then took macro pictures of it. So that's what that was all about. So thanks for being here and let's get started. Question number one comes from Tim. Spencertown, New York. After seeing videos in the use of Hive Alive fondant, I'm curious about the best way to use the fondant in an Apame hive. Do I place directly above the frames or should I open the package and place them in the feeders? This is my first colony of bees. As mentioned, I have an Apame hive, two 10 frame deep boxes. So that's fun. Uh, I have a couple Ape of May hives now, as you already know. We just mentioned Hive 30, that's an Ape of May hive. 
put the bees in there. We're going to see how it works in winter. And I see issues with it just with the venting, but the bees fix that for me. Insulation is going to be important too. So I actually have two of them right now, and uh, I will be taking the bees out of a hive that, that has uh, a poor fit between the wooden boxes. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to transfer all the bees on one of these warm days. So it sounds like this weekend, I'll be pulling all the frames out and putting them, transferring them to an APMA hive. So I will have the one that comes configured the way the company sent it to me, and they sent it to me without charge, so I have to admit that too. And, uh, but I'm not biased. I am going to be critical of the way the thing is set up. And uh, I'm glad that they sent it to me, but there are things I did not like, especially the venting. So with the second hive, transferring bees into it, I'm going to provide insulation the way I would in other hives. So that's what we're talking about, Ape May hives. If you don't know, you can Google those. I'll put a link down to mine. I have a page started on the waytobee.org that is just an Ape May page. So each subsequent video that I put up I will also copy and paste that onto the website so those of you can check it. So the thumbnail today was this. These are the Apame Hive Top Feeders. I guess previous editions of this, it was one piece. So this one, it comes from the Ergo, it's called, and uh, you get two of these. So that way you can split your hive. So they come with a divider board, and that's the configuration that I have on right now that you will see if you watch the very end sequences on today's video. Uh, so there would be five frames under this. Now the way Apemai tells you to do it, they want you to put four frames under there. I put five because they're my wooden frames. I wanted to see if they would fit, and they did. So five for me is better than four. Now this feeder, I want you to see some. See all these little holes in it? Let me go ahead and pull that out. See the little holes here? They're designed to vent air right through the top. And we'll pull this thing apart. If you look through here, these are the bottom feeder holes right here and here. So from the top, it looks like this. Bees come up through here, climb over this edge right here, and uh, they access liquid feed or dry feed. So right now, hopefully, because it's been freezing, so we're converting to two to one syrup for those who are really trying to save some last minute bees, colonies that are lacking like behind, don't have enough stores, things like that. Uh, and others are shifting to fondant. So by the second week of October, I think it's cold enough. A lot of people are going to fond it, and that's what we're talking about today. So this has a couple of settings. These little inserts, see the bottom piece here? If you put them in like this, bees can come up and they can feed on the syrup that's in here, but they can't get out and scoot around and get onto the free surface area of the syrup and die. They drown. So when you pull this out and flip it this way, it's designed for dry feeding, meaning that the bees can get out and they have access to this entire space. And that's what we're talking about today with this question from Tim. So the other thing is, what are we putting in here? Fondant, how should we put it in there? So here's the thing, Hive Live Fondant right here. Happen to have a pack. This is what I'm using. And what would I do if I wanted to put this in here? I'll tell you, because that's why you're here. You want to know. I would cut it in half. Because look at the size of it. It fits in here lengthwise. So if you just cut this right down the center, and on the back there's a seam there, so if you just cut along that seam, leave this enclosed. In other words, leave as much of it as possible covered in the plastic that it comes in. Cut it in half and put one half right in here, and make sure the half that's been cut is the side that Push the side that has a seam right against this wall, and then that will leave the cut piece open with a travel corridor through here. The bees will walk over the top of it, they'll walk down the edges, they'll go into the edge of your fondant, and they will clean it out of this entire pack. And then you save the other half of it, if you don't have two of them, but if you have two, you can put one in each side. And uh, so once you do that, then you have your second fondant pack in storage if you wanted to just feed one at a time and keep one in the freezer or something like that. And then as they consume it, and they do by the way, last year I wondered, would they get all the way into every little crevice and corner in here and feed on every part of the fondant and clean it out until there's nothing left for the plastic? Yeah, they will. But the other part of this question was, what if I put it underneath of this 
on top of the frames underneath. And I don't like that for a couple of reasons. One is you have to press it down to get it to be in there to get these to seat flush. The other thing is uh, when you cut open a tiny section for the bees to get up there and consume it, how do we check on the progress of the consumption of the hive alive fondant if it's underneath one of these? So you have to think about November, December, January, you wanna check on your fondant progress. Now I have to get into the hive pull the outer cover off, which is the insulated cover, pull the feeder off, and then get to the fondant. Now what happens while I'm getting to this fondant? All the air that's in here, they create a heat capsule in there. It's kind of secondary heating from the cluster of bees in wintertime. And when we open that up, that heat escapes, and then we pull the fondant out if it even needed to be replaced. We had to expose the bees and get rid of their stored heat in there just to check the fondant. If we find out it's not completely consumed, we package everything right back up and close it up. And of course, you would go out there with your other piece of fondant ready to go. And if it's a really cold day, it's not gonna squeeze down really easy. So the warm weather days, it stays in a, in a liquid state the entire time. But on a really warm day, when these are warm, they compress and adapt and, and mold themselves, just as you would think when it's warm. When it's cold, they'll be really rigid, so now you've kind of got to work it a little while or preheat it before you put it down on the frames. So I don't do that. And that includes whether I'm using a standard inner cover. So the wooden inner covers, if I'm using a feeder shim or anything else, it sits on top of that. So here's the frames underneath. Here's your inner cover. Your feet is on top of the inner cover. And again, the reason for that is if I pop the outer cover, I haven't vented off all that critical air that's in there. I have uh, right now sensors for heat and humidity inside hives. And when you pull off a cover like that, because remember the bees are clustered in the wintertime, and what they're doing is they're conserving their own energy. It's called a state of torpor. So it's really not like a bear that goes into hibernation. They're in a state of torpor. And when they're cold and clustered tight like that, they still have secondary heat coming off of them. They're heating one another, but they can't do that without passive heat going into the space. And this is why through the years, I've stopped using upper vents. I've stopped using upper entrances because the bees that had an insulated cover over the top of them and that had venting only through the entrance down below kept their condensation and moisture to the inside walls below the cluster. When there's an insulated cover up above and you don't violate that, there's a heat capsule that forms and we validate that through thermal imagery. So it's very interesting and so I've learned, slow learning, but that's why I'm passing it on to you because I, I did all of that in the past. And that's why I like feeders where I can attend to the feed, whether it's dry sugar in a rapid round or something like that, or a fondant pack right on top. You can check these things without pulling off the inner cover and looking at what's going on underneath. That's why I prefer it. So that's the method. Cut them in half. They fit right in there and you're good to go. And then, of course, you put this cover on. And look at all the venting up through the top of that too. There's even venting through these little capsules here. And remember they're in the dry feed position. So there's even vents through that. And that's why if I weren't evaluating this for the APMA group to see what would happen, I would put double bubble reflectex right on top of that. And then I would put that insulated outer cover on top because I don't want the venting to go on. And as I mentioned, these little vents along the periphery here, they started off in the middle, so these two come together, so there'll be double layer of venting here. And uh, they've already sealed all these up. Yay, bees. I'm very glad to see that they did that with propolis. So that's how you do it, with that kind of feeder. And with any kind of feeder, actually, that's why I explained kind of the options there. If you're putting fondant on, you're in a great position, of course, and use the fondant to plug the little round hole in a standard inner cover it plugs that hole and all you've done then is cut a little hole there. So I recommend uh, not exposing this. We don't want it to dry out. If it dries out, they have to consume it to get rid of it. So we want it to stay as moist and fresh as possible and the bees will clean it out, as I mentioned before, all the way through these packets. When you go out there to check them, you bring a replacement packet just in case. 
you pull the spent one and you put the new one right back on, close it up, and you're done. And you did not expose the entire top box to do it. So, enough talking about that. Let's move on to question number two. This comes from Michael, State of Maryland. It says here, I would like to start with, I'm a firm believer in the potential health benefits of raw, unfiltered honey. My concern and question regards pyrolizidine alkaloids, which are PAs. These toxins have been around forever, but appear to be of increasing concern. With many honey samples exceeding tolerable levels throughout the world, do you feel this is a real concern or a current concern for the beekeeper? What about the ramifications of selling or giving away honey that could be high enough in PAs that a customer, young or old, could eat enough to be toxic? We cannot afford to test out batches of honey. This seems like a real unknown concern for the backyard beekeeper. Okay, so this is going to be one of those complex areas because what is that stuff anyway? It is a plant's way of defending itself from herbivores. So these plants generate this material, pyrolizidine alkaloids, and it's a way that they protect themselves. Insects eat the plants too, feed on the nectar and things like that, honeybees. There are 6,000 species of plants that have this material. Like for example, on my property, comfrey would be one of them. So don't let the alarm bells go ringing, but I would like to talk a little bit about um, responsibility for the honey that you have. Uh, so we know that there's a lot of fake honey out there in the world and real raw local honey is in demand. So beekeepers are able to sell that for a premium. Very small backyard sideline operations can generate really good income. So like a quart of raw honey right now goes for about $22 here, but I've heard of people getting almost double that. So when there's a perceived quality for honey, you can get a lot of money for it, but you do have a responsibility to know kind of and declare what your honey is composed of. So for me, for example, because there's such a variety of plants in the environment out here, and depends on when the honey's taken off, spring, summer, fall, uh, you would have like this time of year, asters are loaded with bees, goldenrod is wrapping up, but the bees are still on it. But there's a lot of diversity of forage, so that's actually good, in my opinion. In other words, when I bottle honey and I put my label on it, it doesn't say, you know, knapweed honey or something like that, which is an invasive plant, by the way, that people do not like to know is around, but the bees are all over it from June to October. So there are a lot of plants that they're getting their nectar from, and uh, goldenrod obviously is a big nectar flow too. And, uh, but that's wrapping up now where sunflowers are at the end. So they're two thirds done. They're still out there. And, uh, also I showed in the video at the end, you'll see a lot of yellow, very tall, six or seven foot sunflowers about this big. Those are Maximilians. And so those are the latest season and the cosmos are working their way out also. So we have all of these contributing plants, which the reason I'm saying that's a good thing is because Diversity of nectar resources, dilution is the solution to pollution. So if there's a toxic plant or something that uh, generates a potentially harmful nectar, uh, both harmful to the bees or to the people that consume the honey later. So what I'm going to do is provide a link for you to read more about this if you want to. This is my opinion now, see, so I'm not going to accept responsibility for telling you what's safe or is not. That's why I'm going to defer to the scientific community. Most of those are involved in the food industry because those have concerns for making sure that food is safe for consumption. And I found that there's very little information about this here in the United States. They're not really all over it. So, and also at the close of today's video, my shout out today deals with a YouTuber that's actually talking about this very thing other toxins in that find their way into your foods. So the other part of it is it uh, is generated in the pollen, by the way. So it has to leach out from the pollen into the honey. And that's why this discussion from Michael here, raw unfiltered honey. So when it's raw unfiltered honey, therefore there's more pollen, therefore there's a potential for more of this material to be in it. The question is, does enough of it leach out into the honey? 
And for example, if you were to eat the pollen in the honey, which you're not going to separate it out, um, is there going to be enough to interact with your body to give you a toxic response? And of course, there are a bunch of symptoms. And I have to be honest, I've never known a single person that had a negative uh, experience with honey. One of the things that every backyard beekeeper should know is that when you're selling or giving away honey or whatever you're doing, uh, that you don't give it to people with babies and then fail to tell them that it should not be given to infants under the age of one. Now, the reason for that is it uh, can collect botulism from the air, by the way, and it can be harbored in the honey and then the baby eats the honey and then the baby gets botulism in its stomach and its stomach is not developed enough, not mature enough as far as the enzymes in that baby's digestive system to deal with it. So a child can actually be at risk from raw honey. To me, that's much more of a concern than this pyrolizidine, the pyrolizidine alkal alkaloids, I'll just say PA. But just for kicks, I did give you a link for those of you who want to read more about it. Personally, I'm not concerned about it at all. Uh, but if you live in an area where the forage is predominantly a single plant source, or if all the forage plants for your bees have high levels of that stuff available, um, then I would probably have my honey tested just to be on the safe side. That would be expensive. But uh, again, the lack of attention to it tells me there's not that big of a problem. So... I would not be worried about it. Also, you should know that if you're selling your honey as a backyard beekeeper, always check in with your Department of Agriculture. I know a lot of people don't want to check in with any authority on any level about anything. But I have to tell you, uh, the responsible side of it, of course, is to check in with your Department of Agriculture, find out what labeling requirements are for your state, and uh, of course, comply with the labeling. So you have to have traceability for your honey. So even when it's a direct sale, you have to have a label on it. It has to have the, the physical weight of the honey that's in that jar. And to the best of your knowledge, the composition of the honey. So it's, I just say wildflower honey because that covers everything. And then my label is the same all the time. You can also leave a little line there where it's a write-in. So if you know that it's predominantly clover honey or something like that, you can write that down. So, but for me, I would never be able to narrow it to a single flower source. And uh, that's an interesting question, but I think it's, I don't see a reason to be alarmed. I think it never hurts to be informed though. So uh, know what forage is in your area and what uh, might be in the honey that you're selling or giving away. Question number three, moving on. Scott from Biz Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. I'm coming into spring here in Brisbane, Australia as a first year beekeeper and loving all your informative Q&As. Thank you so much. I currently have two deep eight frame brood boxes and a flow super which they have not started filling on the top with a queen excluder. Both brood boxes are fully drawn out and the queen has the top brood box fully laid out with all stages of brood. The bee numbers in both brood boxes and flow super are pretty good across all frames. My question is, will they likely fill out the top brood box with honey before filling the flow super? I added the second box to reduce the risk of swarming throughout the season with the intention that they would fill the flow super with honey first. Okay, first year beekeeper. So this is probably a young colony of bees. But now what I'm saying here can actually conflict with um, even what the inventor of the flow hive tells you to do. Uh, their configurations are different than mine. And uh, because I live in a cold climate, so... When I talk about the flow hive, and for those of you who are running away from your computers right now because you hate the flow hive, uh, stick around because this works regardless of whether it's a flow hive, APMA hive, or a standard Langstroth hive. So I always start with a new colony in a single deep box, whether it's eight or 10 frames. I don't put any other boxes on it yet. And we start them down there because that's where I want them to be anchored with their brood near the entrance. We have so we have a single deep inner cover and then an outer cover and nothing else. 
And so once they start to build up, I, I'm not a fan of adding multiple boxes right away because you can end up in a scenario as described here where they move up to the upper area because it's probably going to be warmer. This is early spring or summer there. And uh, they tend to build their brood up there. And then you could assume that as things heat up, as the year progresses, they'll migrate back down. But you can reduce that potential problem of having brood in your upper boxes by keeping it to a single box until they filled out 80% of that box. So if you've got 10 frames, that's 8 out of 10 frames. So that means full of resources, brood, they're anchored, all the nursery activity and everything is there. And the way you reduce the propensity to swarm is by not letting them fill out all of the frames with resources before adding that next box. So then what I do is once eight out of 10 frames or seven out of eight, if it's an eight frame box, uh, then I put a medium super above that. And then they'll go to work on that. If it doesn't have drawn comb, they'll draw the comb. They'll start to store their resources because this is kind of their standard order. They go ahead and fill out rings of pollen and nectar, and then they start storing honey further up. And then if there's no top vent and if there's no upper entrance, they will continue to keep their brood down near the primary entrance. And if that entrance is not too large, that's the other part of it. If you have a huge entrance with a lot of ventilation going on down there, they may actually move their brood up and away from that a little bit. So the other part of this is a reduced entrance, which seems counterintuitive, but based on what we find in feral colonies all over the place, smaller entrances are what the bees would prefer. So keeping a smaller entrance keeps the brood again down near there because they're going to circulate air through over the brood to keep them ventilated because that's the most critical part of their hive. Then once that second box is done, and that's why I'm not in a pickle here, for example, I do that in the spring. So I have the deep box, the medium, and the medium is chock a block with honey before we super anything above that. Now, once again, you don't want them to create a, a honey block. So that second box also when eight out of 10 frames are full, or seven out of eight if it's an eight frame box, when those are full of capped honey, or they've filled out every cell with nectar, for example, then you can go ahead and put your queen excluder on if you wanna do that, and that's when your other super goes above that, the flow super. And that's because what's above that is available for you to take off. So me here, we had kind of crappy weather this summer, but uh, so even colonies that did poorly at the end of the year, when we count on that late season nectar flow and things like that, and that fails, I have a deep and a medium. So I've got 50 pounds of honey at least on insulated cover over that. And if we don't get a surplus beyond that, at least I don't have to feed them through winter. So they've still got the resources that they need to get through. And I always do that first. Now, let's address the problem where they're not filling the flow super. Really during your first year, you may not get a flow super full of honey or multiple supers of honey if you have a standard Langstroth box. They may not build up that way. So what you can do is manipulate that a little bit. So you can take your medium super that is full of honey now or 90% full of honey, take it off. You can put your queen excluder on, making sure that your queen is below it Put your flow super on, put the medium box on top of the flow super, then the inner cover, then the outer cover. And now they're traveling through your flow super, which is actually a deep box. They're traveling through that to get to their honey up above, which can encourage them then to start to fill those frames in the middle. So that's one way to do it. I personally don't use the queen excluders. Once I've established, and now we're going to backpedal a little bit. Once they have that deep brood box, once they have the medium box that's full of honey, if their brood arcs up into that medium box and it's, it's evident that they're not creating a 100% honey bridge there, I'll add a second medium. And by using mediums, it means that I'm expanding the space incrementally so we don't overwhelm the bees. Bees don't like it when we put them in a hive and we provide them with a huge amount of space right off the bat they tend to slow down their productivity. I don't know why that is. I just know that that's what happens. So if we don't incrementally 
increase the size of the hive, we actually impede their progress. It seems like it should be the other way around. Oh, lots of space, therefore make lots of new bees and provision it. But it's not the way to do it. And this is why, shift gears here a little bit, when I do the five frame nucleus hives, and then add another five frame over that, and then when that's full, another five frame over that, I get 15 deep frames in a very short amount of time compared to the standard wide configurations. So it has to do with their sense of space, how they use the space, how warm it is in there and everything else. So I hope that answered your question. So will they fill the flow super with honey first? No. <laughs> so if you've got space down below, they'll continue to work down below and probably not do anything with the flow super because it's just too big. In fact, I wonder if the flow hive people, they're very expensive, but if they would consider a mechanized medium deep flow super for areas that get a small nectar flow where they don't necessarily have the ability to fill full half gallon frames. Each of those flow frames is a half gallon. And uh, if they had medium height ones, it seems like smaller colonies could fill them and you'd have a harvesting opportunity. I'm not saying that that's what they're planning to do, but it's uh, food for thought because it happens so often that the bees, it's just like if you had a deep, put a medium on, and then you just put a deep on top of that. Some colonies never get that big or your environment doesn't support that many resources and or they swarm and they cut their numbers down and they just can't be productive enough to store that much honey. So if they had options for incremental additions with uh, mediums, that could work. But that's my configuration. Deep, medium first, honey for winter stored at the beginning of the year before we get into the supering that would be the honey that we take off. That way we don't end up with a colony of bees at the end of the year, this time of year, without enough honey to get themselves through winter. So we leave that on for them. Backyard beekeeping, we're not commercial beekeepers. We don't need that honey. I understand that honey is worth a lot more than sugar syrup, and that's why we can pull off all the honey and just feed them sugar syrup back. But that's not the goal in backyard beekeeping. We want them to sustain themselves. We want to get these bees and calibrate the size of their hive and the configuration to match the number of bees inside and their productivity and the amount of resources that are in the environment and everything else. And then we want them to do all this on their own without feeding. So the only hives, the only bees I feed um, are going to be late season nucleus hives, splits, things like that. Or if you just got a package of bees or something, which hopefully wouldn't be happening this time of year, but in uh, the southern hemisphere with uh, summer ahead of you that could be a situation too where you would be feeding them so and the hive live fun and by the way goes on these hives that even have 60 pounds or more because it's an emergency ration in the event that we get a really warm winter which by the way works against the bees which is strange but if the winter's really warm they're more active without the ability to bring in new resources therefore they can consume the resources that are in the hive and end up without enough feed that's why that little bit of extra food security for the bees is really important. Question number five comes from Keith Spillman. Just had a big robbing frenzy in my bee yard the day after a really good inspection. It was pretty strange, bees fighting on the landing board and in front of the hives, but foragers still bringing in pollen during the event. Is that normal? Yeah, I've seen that. When there's a conflict on the landing board, foragers are returning, you see the pollen coming in and them just arriving there. Robbers do not bring in pollen. So when you see the, the robbing frenzy going on, yeah, resident bees are still doing kind of what they do. But uh, normally a queen right colony is not very easy to take over. So also had one hive bearding during the robbing. The temp was in the high 70s. It was a pretty wacky event. I think it got it under control with robbing screens. My question is, how long do you leave the screens on after the robbing stops? That's a really good question, and I'm going to link a robbing video so you guys can see what that looks like down in the video description. And uh, here's the problem. Once they successfully get into the hive, these are scouts that are looking to rob other bees. This is a timely question from Keith because uh, this is when they're running out of resources in the environment and they're going to start looking at other beehives to attack. 
And so their bees are getting pressure from hornets and wasps, and they're getting pressure from other honeybees. And to me, the honeybees are the biggest threat. So if they can get past those guards on your landing board, which is why our entrances need to be small, how small should they be? Three inches in length, two to three inches in length, depending on the colony, and three eighths of an inch in height. And uh, it's really interesting because that three eighths means that you don't have to put a mouse guard on so that you can still clean out if there are dead bees and things like that. And they have great video sequences coming up, not in this video today, but this week of uh, mice trying to get into beehives and showing that that 3 8 entrance keeps them out. So really good stuff there. But uh, so reduce the entrance. Now, how long do the bees remember that? Once you put that robbing screen on because they've had a robbing event, as long as those foragers are alive, the ones that were robbing, they're gonna continue to come back to that hive at the beginning of every day looking for resources. And when they know, by the way, the resource is there, they'll come to that at 48 or 49 degrees Fahrenheit. They don't, you know, so they'll come early. They'll come while it's still cold out because they risk it because they know that there's a resource at the other end of that flight. And where if they're just foraging for new resources, they start doing that in the 50s. So very interesting stuff. How do we know? Because they tested it with thermals to see what they would do. So you have to leave your robbing screens on now. I would do it until meaningful cold temps get in four weeks minimum. That's what I would do. And then you could take it off again. So once your bees, the resident bees, once they adapt, they can do all their normal functions with the robbing screens present. Question number six, moving on. Brandon from, uh-oh, I'm not going to pronounce this right. Talas Kayseri, Turkey. Okay. My family and I have wanted to keep honeybees for a long time. We live in central Turkey in a temperate climate. Three and a half months of winter where the average daily high is still above 43 degrees Fahrenheit, but there is snow for about one and a half months. We live in an apartment, but we have a very large open and unused balcony that we want to install a beehive on. Which style of beehive would you recommend for beginners in a situation like this? Or would you discourage it altogether? So this is a really interesting question because it actually ties into a lot of city dwellers, even in New York City and places like that, where people put beehives up high on top of buildings, terraces and balconies and things like that. So what it really comes down to is how close are your neighbors? I know that all balconies are not created equal, so... Um, some of them have extensions that stick out, so you can't even see your neighbor's balcony, for example. So those would also direct your bees out and away. So I don't see that as a huge barrier for keeping bees. The other thing is, what direction does this balcony face? So is it a warm weather balcony? Does it face south? That kind of thing. If it faces north, it's uh, going to be a cold and shaded balcony all through winter. Kind of tough on the bees. But uh, this sounds like a mild climate for beekeeping. So the next thing is what kind of beehive, and this is the same whether you want to put this on a rooftop or a balcony, wherever you have to use an elevator to get there or stairs to climb and things like that. We don't want to be lugging full boxes, full supers of honey and things like that. That's my opinion. So if I were looking at a balcony and I wanted to put a beehive on it, knowing that I still want to use a balcony, by the way. So we wouldn't want to uh, have a big mess of honey equipment and everything out there either. So this is a beginning beekeeper. I say a horizontal hive. And uh, I'll justify that. So there are two types of horizontal hives that I particularly like. So I'm not going to talk about top bar hives. Uh, but the Layens hive or the Langstroth, horizontal long Langstroth hive. Uh, the Langstroth hive would have the most compatible equipment. And the advantage that I see to having that on your balcony is uh, your entrance to that hive would extend out over the balcony. In fact, I might even consider making an extension to the entrance so that it really sticks out. And so your bees can follow a channel out, like if a tree were thick and there was an entrance going out. I have entrances on some of my observation hives that are eight inches long. So you could extend that out, and this keeps the bees flying in and out without hitting a landing board, without collecting. And then if they 
um, cluster somewhere, you would have some kind of visor up against the hive itself. And you tend these bees from the back side. So from the balcony side, you flip the top up, and now we have access to all the cover boards and all the frames. So all that you would be lifting there would be a frame at a time. Also, you start your colony small, but the hive configuration remains the same. So there's a follower board there. So as far as your bees know, when you first put them in, uh, there's four or five frames, Langstroth size frames, if we're talking about the long Langstroth. And then you wait for those to build up. And then your spare frames are over here on the other side of your follower board, of your divider board. So then as they need more space, you're pulling frames from over here and you're putting them here and moving the divider board. So we're not lugging a lot of equipment up and down stairs, up and down elevators, and into your home. So I think a horizontal hive would be fantastic for that because the only initial thing I recommend building it on the spot. So, or if you've got a friend, if you're not uh, good with carpentry and things like that, I would spec out the plans for the horizontal hive, the way you want it to be configured. And uh, then I would have a friend come and uh, assemble it on site. So you don't have to then, of course, carry a big heavy beehive up through all of that. So it could be very easily put together, taken apart, and then bolted back up on site. What do you think? I think that's a good idea. But if others are keeping bees on their balconies, for example, and what's worked and hasn't worked, Great opportunity for you to chime in in the comment section down below and share what your experiences have been, good or bad. You also want to check in with building management. Make sure there's no rules against it because they're considered livestock here. I don't know what they're considered in Turkey. So, um, yeah, let us know how that goes because that would be an interesting project. And I hope you make videos about it, by the way. That would be great. Question number seven. This is from David Chico, California. I always have a problem with wax moths destroying comb. I freeze the frames and store in clear containers, but sometimes I still have comb damage. I'm thinking about using Hurtan or Paramoth crystals. What do you think? Okay. Well, I'm going to give you several uh, things to think about on this one. Uh, the other thing is I have to think back on problems I've had with wax moths in the past. And uh, wax moths for me, for those of you who don't know, the, the wax moth flies into empty spaces in beehives or they get into unattended areas in beehives, like if the beehive's too big for the bees that populate it, and they start, they lay their eggs, and then those eggs hatch, and then the larvae, the little wax worms, and they're very tiny when they come out, by the way. I've seen them in beeswax, in observation hives, where the beeswax is up against the glass so that we can see the little tiny larvae moving through the thickness of the wax and consuming it as they go, but being very careful not to chew through the surface of the wax where the honeybees can find them. I always found that interesting. But I also knew they were doomed because as soon as that little wax moth larvae, that little um, wax worm, as soon as it chewed through or got big enough to where it couldn't hide in the comb anymore, uh, the bees took care of it and got it right out of there. So I'm going to give you a couple of frames of thought here. One is when I finish with extractions from frames and supers, this occurred to me based on this problem. Um, I have a habit of putting them out at a feeding station. And uh, when you put it out at a feeding station, I know some people put it right back on their hives, which for me is a robbing risk. So you put wet frames that have been through a honey extractor that are putting that scent of honey into the air and you take it back and put it on the hive that you took them off of and then they're going to clean that up and get that honey out of there so you can put it in storage. I hope you do that at a time when the other foragers in the area, because it's already past harvest time, if they're keen on robbing each other, that can kick off robbing. So my solution to that is to put that out at a feeding station well away from your apiary. And then I noticed too, this is one of the things I like when I look at feeding stations, frames of honey. Honeybees aren't the only things that go there. Bumblebees show up, yellow jackets show up, European hornets show up, bald-faced hornets show up, which are just wasps. But we get to look at all of the different species to see what's going on in your area. 
And for me, I can collect specimens if I want to of all the different species that show up. So it's fun to visit a feeding station and see what's going on there. The other thing that occurs to me is the honeybees are, some people refer to them as vegan wasps because all their proteins come from, when they forage, their proteins come from plants. But these wasps that are there, their proteins come from animal protein. That's what they feed their developing larvae. So when they're cleaning out these cells and getting the honey and everything, they're chewing everything apart. If those wasps sense that there are eggs or larvae in any of those cells, they're gonna harvest them for you. I think in retrospect, that may be why I don't have wax worms in my stored frames. So the flip side of that is that I want to store my frames in such a way that it's unappealing to wax moths so they don't lay new eggs once I put them in storage. So pretty much you've all seen that you stack your boxes 90 degrees to one another. So long side, out, crisscross. That keeps it open air. Airflow goes through it. It wouldn't hurt to run a really low wattage fan in that space to keep the air moving. They don't like that. They don't like... Um, light. So if you had an LED light that's inexpensive to run, you keep the space lit. Wax moths fly around at night and lay their eggs. So and then cycling them through your freezer is of course a big help. But uh, I don't even do that. I don't cycle them through the freezer. But I know for those who are concerned, you can do that. But where I put them in, you know, in storage here, they're gonna, it's cold storage. It's whatever the outside temperature is, that's what it is for the frames and boxes that I have in storage. And uh, I've not had wax moths get into that. The ones that wax moths got into and kind of took over were when we had a dead out in winter or something like that. And when spring cleaning came, I didn't get to it right away. Or I just set it aside somewhere, stored it, closed it up, put the lid on, that kind of thing. So again, what was going on there? It's dark, it's closed up, no airflow. Perfect environment for wax moths. So that's what I do, and that's why it hasn't happened for me. But now we're going to talk about there are treatments. So for those of you who have continuing problems with wax moths, and even with the ventilation and the stacking them in open positions, uh, I used to also put trash bags over them. So when I'm stacking boxes, I put a, a trash bag down, another box, trash bag over that, another box. And with really large trash bags, you flip it up so one bag covers two levels and that prevents things from getting in there. The ones that I stored in hive butlers, I put, because I had frames of drawn comb in hive butlers, and I put uh, wise dry desiccant packs in there too to keep it super dry. Wax worms don't like super dry environments either. They need some humidity. So, but the other thing is for those of you who want to treat, because two things were, were mentioned here, Kirtan and Paramoth. I don't know if it's pronounced Kirtan or Sertan, C-E-R-T-A-N. But if you go to, just it's probably available all over the place, but if you go to Better Bee, uh, you can look at their wax moth larvicide, and uh, that stuff's expensive. So not only are you gonna treat it with something that's supposed to last an entire season, it's pretty darn expensive, and in my opinion, unnecessary, if you can store it in the ways that I've described. But it's $34 to treat, 100 frames. So that's 10 supers. So that's pretty expensive. And you're spraying it on there. I can't even pretend to know. I've never used it. So I don't, I can't, you know, tell you negative or positive what having crystals and things like that on your frames. It just instinctively to me, it's not something that I feel like I need to add to the hive. So if you've used it and it works great, or if you had a wax moth problem that you just could not solve, and you had to go to this stuff. That's That would be my thing. In other words, if every year I had a wax moth problem in the way that I'm storing my stuff, and uh, I need some kind of equalizer now because I'm just losing too much comb. Because the other side of that is, you can power wash plastic foundation. And it is yucky. When, when they put their webbing in there and everything else, bees don't like it. That could cause bees to abscond. 
So, but I've never, like I said, I've only had unoccupied or dead outs uh, have that problem. When I pulled the frames, extracted honey, put them out to a feeding station, brought them in, put them in racks, put them back in boxes, juxtaposed the boxes 90 degrees to each other, had airflow, uh, kept them in a bee shed, and went through winter. Mice sometimes could get in uh, into the boxes and chew some of the comb if they, if they had that opportunity. But uh, I've not had big wax moth problems, so that's my opinion. I would try every possible thing before I bought that stuff. Because you could run, what's it going to cost you to run a fan all winter in your storage shed? $34.95. And, uh, or have an LED light on, or keep your stuff in open air. I think there are lots of other things that you could do. But you're welcome to try and then let us know if you've used that stuff and uh, maybe that worked. So question number eight, Nathan from New York. I did some research on Ross Rounds and bought one for next year. I was accidentally given a, hoth, a hog half comb instead. The company has given me the option to keep the hog half comb or exchange it for a Ross Round. I watched your video on the Ross Round, but do you have any experience with the hog half comb or opinion about it? My concern is that the hog half comb has too much plastic compared to the Ross Round. Is that a correct statement? Okay, so regarding the plastic, I don't think the hog halves use more plastic than Ross Rounds. The Ross Rounds has two, they have two white plastic rings. I'm going to link that video for those of you who want to see what we're talking about here. Two plastic rings go together, and those are brand new with every single one that you put out. And they go together, and sandwiched in the middle is the beeswax, 100% beeswax foundation, which is very thin. It's not like the foundation that you're using for your bees to draw out comb. So this is edible. And then with the Ross Round, they're building the comb out on both sides. So you have a double thickness. And it's in a round, and then that goes into clear plastic. So we've got two plastic pieces that come together to sandwich onto that comb. And then we've got two clear plastic pieces that complete the case when you cut it out. And you have the option to have those be transparent or one to be semi-opaque. So it could be white or transparent. I like them to be transparent on both sides because the label holds them together. And then the people can see on either side exactly what the comb looks like that they're getting. And the hog half is half of that. So in other words, the bottom of the hog half, they build out the comb and then they cap it. And so it's it's like if you took a, a beehive comb that had that center in it and you cut through the center and then the half was just one side or the other in a clear plastic container. So if anything, I almost think the hog half has less plastic in it. Uh, as far as a preference goes, I really don't have a preference one or the other. I do know that uh, people that buy comb honey in this vicinity, uh, usually it's older people that have childhood memories of chewing honeycomb when they had a cold or a sore throat or something like that, and they prefer the rounds. So if you offer both, um, you'll find that the rounds here uh, sell out faster, and it's sold by the ounce. So you can get they're eight ounces roughly, and you can get 11 or $12 for them. Some people get more uh, than that. But I personally prefer the Ross Rounds. Uh, the configurations are easy. They come with their own. It's like a shallow super. And uh, that's it. So it's personal preference. So, But I don't think that one has more. I don't think the Ross Round uses less plastic. I think maybe they actually use more. So that was the last question for today, and now we're in the fluff part. So we were talking about Hive Alive today, and if you guys have bought, have purchased Hive Alive fondant or the Hive Alive syrup, I use both of those things. Um, you may have received an email that says they're out of stock. Out of stock at a critical time of year when everybody needs it. So if you can find that stuff somewhere and you didn't buy it yet, uh, you're going to find it hard to get. Uh, is it exponentially better than other fondant that you could buy? I don't know. I would look at reviews and see how people like the fondant that they bought. I think the distinctive uh, part of it is, part of this composition, of course, 
it imitates somewhat the Hive Alive syrup that you can mix with your um, sugar syrup uh, that you feed the bees to help with nosema. I don't know. I've not seen any data that says that Hive Alive fondant works on nosema in the same way that the syrup would. But um, they list, of course, all their ingredients uh, here. And there's a lot of stuff here that's not normally found in fondant. So it is a fortified fondant mix. But they're out of stock. So I noticed on their website, I looked at that. It says you can pre-order, but I don't know if it's going to come in time because uh, they underestimated the demand for it. So if you've got it, great. I have it. I'm going to use it. So that's out of stock. And uh, today, by the way, oh yeah, and I already talked about hive number 30, the APMA hive. They're looking strong. They actually may be able to get their queen back mated and might be in good business going right into winter. And of course, we'll have that secondary hive. Not a fair comparison, really, because the colony that I'm going to put into the other APMA hive is a very strong colony in a hive that they just happen to be chewing apart. It's falling apart. It's old. It's time to upgrade it. So I thought, hmm, maybe just transfer frame for frame right into that uh, box. And we'll follow up on that. But I'm going to insulate that one. No top venting. I'm going to take care of those upper uh, feeding stations there. And they're going to be insulated. Everything's going to be closed up. So the only vent is right through the landing board. So that's going to be fun. Uh, today's shout out, by the way, goes to a channel that I found because I had to talk about this material that's being found in pollen in honey so that you'll understand more about uh, the potential toxicity of uh, some of the things that are finding their way into your foods. And they talk about honey and tea and other resources as well. So the channel, the link will be down in the video description, but it's called Teach Ethnobotany. So, and the video title is Plant Secondary Metabolism Alkaloids. So, I'm going to give you a link to that. You can look at that. And uh, that's pretty much it for today. So, I hope uh, you benefited from some of the things we talked about today. And I uh, hope you feel that you did not waste your time. And on these warm days, these are your last opportunities here in the northeastern, northeastern United States to finish configuring your hive so they can seal things up. So I get a lot of questions about, should I go ahead and put on fondant and things like that now? Uh, I say the second week of October, because we're starting October very soon. So this is the last, um, the last video in September for me. And uh, you wanna do that obviously on a warm day, we're working around the weather. The weather can go bad and stay bad. So we have no idea what the future is going to bring. So yeah, go ahead and finish your harvest. I don't think uh, any of the hives are going to be putting on more weight right now. And uh, also, this is your last opportunity to combine weak colonies. So if you do those landing board counts right now, so just before I came in to do this video today, I went out and looked at all the landing boards and all the hives to make sure that the pollen uh, flow. The pollen that's coming in is at a high rate so that I can make sure that I don't have queenless colonies this late in the year. Very difficult to do anything about them right now. If they're queenless, your options are let them run out their lives and then expire or combine them with another colony. But now we've got a bunch of resources, larger colonies, and uh, you can even split those resources into another colony. If they're queenless, you could take five frames of a 10 frame queenless uh, deep and you can put five on this colony and five on that colony if they if they have some low resources that you could start to pack down so that's it for today and uh, i want to thank you for watching and spending your time with me here and enjoy the videos that follow today's discussion it's just showing you what's going on in the landscape right here recorded today thanks for watching have a fantastic weekend